So we're going to dive right in. Um, it's 2.01 and we have not a moment to spare. I'm Billy Wimsat. I'm proud to be the executive director of Movement Voter PAC for the purposes of this call. And I am part of an incredible staff team and volunteer team that works together to make the magic happen here. And we're going to dive right into it. So first, a couple quick notes. Um, the recording, oh, first of all, um, if you know anyone who wants to be on this call, just invite them right now. We're all organizers. Let's organize our friends to participate and, and experience this together. There will also be a recording and slides coming in a couple of days. You can use the chat for questions, but no big debates about current events. You can do that on social media. Um, thank you very much. And let's dive in. <clears throat> so welcome new people. There might be a couple new people there. I heard there were over 1,100 people RSVP'd for this chat. So people, people are like desperate. How are we going to save ourselves? You come to the right place. So if you're new to MVP, welcome. We support hundreds of local organizations in all the key states and districts to engage tens of millions of voters to win elections and transform policy. So I'm just going to tell you a couple quick things. We basically do the ground game. If you want to put us in a box, that's what we do. And if you're someone who is new to MVP and you want the linear explanation, you're not going to get it on this call. Go to our website, uh, movement.vote, where the first thing you're going to see, <clears throat> next slide, please, is, see that little button? You can click there. Here's how we win. You will see a linear explanation and a slideshow that explains in detail how MVP works. We also have our, our amazing volunteers are giving presentations almost every other day now, all over the country, Zoom salons. You can host a Zoom salon. You can join a Zoom salon that explain the basics of MVP. That's not what we're doing here today. This is the advanced version. And we're trying something new. This is not a dog and pony show. This is a new experiment where we are in the thick of figuring out together this unprecedented, uncharted waters of this election. And we're going to do it with me and our four regional directors, which we just put in place this new structure with regional directors. And the regional directors are so great because they have a lot of on the ground knowledge of what's happening in our states. They talk, they're the ones managing our state advisors who you've heard from many times um, and interacting with partners and they're thinking big picture about the region and about overarching strategy. So this is a new thing we're trying. Uh, we hope you like it. We're it's it's going to be a little bit like a podcast. We're we're experimenting with this format. Um, but again, it's not going to be the linear version. Um, this is the kind of advanced senior seminar. So that assumes you basically know what we're doing and why. So let's go on to Super Tuesday. Oh. Super Tuesday was yesterday. Um, I, you know, I, I made this slide and I put question marks and then I took them out. What a day yesterday. Um, there was, there were some really great little bright spots. There was the Travis County DA in Austin, Texas. Uh, we won, which is great. Our partners won. Um, and then on the national level, Haley is out and it is Trump all day, every day, and he is coming for us. Trump is coming for Biden. He is coming for us. And everything is at stake. And that was already clear before, but now it's really, really clear. And not only was yesterday Super Tuesday, but it was exactly eight months out from Election Day, November 5th, 2024, that fateful day that will decide the future of the world. Um, and it's actually, we're only six and a half months out from the beginning of early voting in Pennsylvania and other states, which will, that's when the election really begins. It's not on a day anymore. It's six weeks. So we have to treat election day as starting in September now. Um, and here and out, the Trump campaign is coming for us. And I don't need to tell you how truly horrifying it would be 
um, and everything we have to do to pre prevent it. I pledge to you, I don't even need to pledge, like I wake up every morning thinking about how we're going to win. I go to sleep every night thinking about how we're going to win. And every time in between that, I'm thinking about what are all the things we can do to pull out all the stops to win all the basic things and, and then creative additional things. Um, and that is what our team is doing. Um, and yesterday, in addition to being a big moment uh, for Trump on, on that side, um, was a big moment for the uncommitted movement. Um, after Michigan, which was a huge thing that, that uh, Michigan last week, we had huge uncommitted turnout in Minnesota, even bigger than Michigan. And we're going to talk about that. And we're in this kind of confusing place where we're both in the heat of a general election and in some ways we're still in a primary election on the Democratic side between Biden and uncommitted, right? So we're holding both of these things and it's very disorienting to be doing both things at once, but that is what we have to do. We have the most elect important election of our lifetimes and we have a huge movement moment around ceasefire to stop this horrifying situation that is happening in Gaza. Um, it's excruciating. And so we're holding both of these things. And how do we do that? We are movement voter pack, right? Movement voter. We do movements and we do elections. And sometimes they go together really well. And sometimes they're in tension with each other. And that is what we do. We work at the intersection of these things. And this is the biggest kind of adaptive challenge that I've ever been a part of is helping these movements come together. And we've seen how this worked, versions of it like the Bernie campaign and the Warren campaign coming together with the Biden campaign, pushing really hard in the advocacy phase, which we're in now, and then coming together to stop fascism, to stop our common opponent in the fall. So that's what we're doing. Uh, if you didn't read the piece I wrote about what happened in Michigan last week, it lays it out in a lot more detail. Uh, we advocate, we vote, that's how we win. Um, so our backs are to the wall and out of necessity comes invention and genius. Our multiracial democracy is threatened. It's very personal for all of us what this means. It's, I just uh, heard about a study, you know, for I'm Jewish, what keeps Jew Jewish people safe? Multiracial democracy. And our multiracial democracy has never been more threatened. And I'm just going to say, I am not going to let them take this away from us. Like, we cannot let them take this away from us by our ancestors, by everything. We cannot let them take this away from us. So that's what we're here to do. Um, is protect ourselves and protect each other and protect the beautiful future we're trying to build together and do it with all of each other, you know. So what are we going to do? How are we going to win? We're going to do this. Um, first of all, I just want to say really clearly, we're going to continue supporting all of our local partners to do their biggest, best work, including our Arab and Muslim partners and our youth partners and communities of color, as well as white working class and cross-pressured voters. It is going to take all of us, okay? We're gonna do the biggest investment we've ever made in the youth vote, uh, which is we're right in the middle of figuring out how to create an even bigger plan with our youth strategy because youth are everything. Young people turning out, we win. Young people not turning out, we lose. That's a huge, huge part of the equation. So we're talking with our partners and strategizing. We're doing all the strategizing behind the scenes with our partners about how we we show up in this moment. Um, and just huge props to all of you who have been showing up with us. Dozens of you have made your biggest political investments or your biggest charitable investments ever. And we need hundreds more people to see that this is the moment. We have to do it. We have to do it now. And also huge, huge appreciation to all of you who've been volunteering. We have local MVP teams. Um, we have four really strong local MVP teams, two in Massachusetts, one in the Seattle area, one in the Bay Area. And we're in the process of building about five more in Chicago, in Washington, D.C. There's a new one forming in Rhode Island. There's a new one 
forming there. We're talking about them in several other places. Um, so come be a part of this. There's nothing more important for any of us to do this year. And we welcome house parties, co-hosts, volunteer teams, and just to get right into what we're doing actually to win, let's talk about what we're gonna do. Here's the map. And yeah, how are we gonna win this fall? Here's the map. None of this is rocket science. We know where the battlegrounds are. There's not, there's no reason to save money for like, what's gonna change three months or six months from now? We know where the battlegrounds are. It's gonna be decided by a couple thousand votes in a couple of these places. People are like, are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? Both of those are stupid ways to think about this election. It is gonna come down to, sorry, I didn't mean to say stupid, I'm a parent. Um, it is gonna come down to, both of them are rational ways to feel, but it is going to come down to a couple thousand votes in a couple states, and it is the margin of effort that is going to decide what future we live in. Next slide, please. And if you read the email I sent yesterday, there are five core strategies that are going to get us over the line that are going to make us win this election. And it's and P.S. None of them are telling people vote for Biden. That doesn't work. Okay. Telling people vote for Biden doesn't work. What works is the following. One, making deep human connections with people, listening to people, training. We're going to have to train thousands of canvassers. Our partners are going to have to train thousands of canvassers in empathetic listening and how to have really like meaningful conversations with people, including personal storytelling. What's your story? Why, why are you out here canvassing to make sure that we are electing Democrats? What's the deep story behind that? We have to have real conversations in both directions that start with storytelling and listening. That is the foundation. That is not what any of the big campaigns or any grass tops things are going to ever do. That's not what they do. That is what our partners do. Third, we make it about Trump. People may, may or may not be excited about button, Biden. We make sure they're really clear on how bad Trump was and how bad Trump will be. Fourth, we highlight the good stuff Biden's doing. Biden did a lot of good stuff. He is doing a lot of good stuff. Judges, trillions of dollars in investment, climate, yada, yada, you name it. We're going to highlight the good stuff. We're going to have compare and contrast. So when people are like, they're not, they're just the same. It's all the same. Let's look at this. Are they the same on abortion? Are they the same on climate? Are they? No, no, they're not the same at all. And then fifth, we have to give people a positive vision for the future in 2025 and all the good things we can do together as we keep this moving toward a progressive decade. So with that, I want to introduce our incredible regional directors, Hallie, Javier, Jillian, and Sarah. And we just put in place, we, so we still focus on our core states, but we also have this regional model on layered on top of that. And you're gonna hear more from them in a moment. So let's start with Hallie in the West. Um, and let me, yeah. So Hallie has Arizona and Nevada, you know, two of the top presidential battleground states, plus Montana, you know, plus all the house races in California. And she's thinking about how to knit those together. Um, Hallie, can you tell us more about how you're seeing this moment and the opportunities? Um, yeah, like what's, I, I lost my notes. <laughs> That's okay. I'm happy to, I can, I can take the ball. Yeah. How, how MVP strategy investing in local groups is helping us win this year. Um, great. So um, happy to be here. Thanks for the opportunity to speak with all of you. Um, so local and state-based groups that are rooted in community are going to be critical to pulling out wins up and down the ballot this year. And when I think about like why that is, there's a few things that stick out to me. So I used to work in campaigns um, and I can tell you there are things that local and state-based groups are set up well to do that campaigns are simply never well set up to do. So campaign investments in field organizing vary. Um, 
the Obama campaign in 2008 was probably the high watermark we'll see in terms of investment in field organizing in our lifetime. Hopefully not, but it could be. Um, but at least in my lifetime so far, I actually ran voter registration nationally for the Obama campaign in 2008. And I can tell you, it was not a priority for us in a consistent way all year long. We didn't even really get started on it until the spring, late spring of 2008. And that's the kind of thing you need to invest in early in the year and really consistently year in, year out. So local and state-based groups are the best vehicle to do that work at scale. In addition, outreach in languages other than English, campaigns are notoriously bad at this. Um, in Nevada, where APIA voters are significant and quickly growing part of the electorate, um, it's particularly critical. One of our partners, One APIA, runs all its voter outreach programs fluently in um, always in five languages and as they scale up, up to 11 languages. The Biden campaign is simply not going to do that. Um, I've also never seen a big federal campaign do a good job with youth vote. They gesture at it, they devote some staffing to it, but the whole setup you need to target a population where many people are not yet on the voter file, where they're living in dorms, they're moving all the time, is so at odds with the more standard campaign field operation that it really never gets the investment that it needs. And then I also think in times where that investment by a campaign is less in field organizing, our groups are sometimes just the biggest scaled operations in the state. I'll say in 2020, I spent the last month in Arizona with the Biden campaign, and I had close friends that did the same in Arizona with um, UFCW, the labor union, as well as with Lucha, one of MVP's biggest partners in Arizona. And comparing notes of them after the election, I can say those operations absolutely had it on the Biden campaign in terms of their scale, their discipline, their organization, their passion. And um, that's what we're going to need to win this. So um, I'm just so excited and honored to be supporting the, the work that the local groups are doing around the country and especially in the West this year. I love, I'm always so happy when Hallie says that because she comes from political campaigns. And when she first came to MVP, she was a little bit like, is this stuff really going to be as as awesome as you said, say it is? And so to hear this from you is actually like a pretty amazing validation. Um, so, okay. So going to the South, um, I want to bring in Jillian. So the South has been obviously this huge site of voter suppression, you know, super racist uh, situation that has been going on for a long time. But, um, you know, and you have Georgia and North Carolina, as well as the rest of the South. Talk to us about how you are thinking about uh, countering this and the situation in in your states, starting with a focus on Georgia and North Carolina. Will do. Thanks, Billy. Thanks so much, everybody, for being with us today. Um, the first thing I want to share is this really exciting victory that we had um, in North Carolina last night with one of our partners, and it's just such an amazing story. I needed to um, to share it with you all today. So we supported um, members of Unite Here's Local Twenty Three who are workers at the Charlotte airport to knock on 15,000 doors for a candidate um, named Rodney Pierce, who is a pro-labor, pro-public education candidate who is running in a primary against um, a conservative Democrat who consistently votes with the Republicans and against workers' interests. Um, and when the results uh, started coming in, our candidate was leading, but he was leading by like less than 1% of the vote. So we're like texting each other in the middle of the night, like, you know, tensions are high. Um, and when there were about 11 p.m., two precincts left, left to report, this guy had a 100 vote lead. Um, so we're all like sitting at home, hitting refresh, refresh, refresh on our cell phones, like waiting to see. And when the final results came in, he won by 42 votes. Unite Here knocked 15,000 doors and won the election by 42 votes. Um, I heard that he was at the victory party. And when the results were announced, the whole room just like erupted in glee. Um, and these kinds of races are so important here in North Carolina because we're usually just one or two Democratic votes away from a Republican supermajority. And so even one Democrat breaking with the party and voting with the Republicans can undermine the entire agenda. Um, I'm also really excited about Unite Here's presence in the state. They have an incredible field program in other states. And so we're in a small membership here in North Carolina. So we're really investing in them um, in an opportunity for them to grow and are excited to have them bring their successful political program um, here to North Carolina. Um, 
we are also quadrupling the number of doors that we are knocking this year across the state. Um, our scaled up field campaign. Wait, is did you say now. quadrupling? I sure did, Billy. Four times, four times as many doors as we've ever knocked before, almost four million doors across the state. Um, and it's not possible without um, our partners who are taking huge chunks of that door knocking, um, of that door knocking lift, also bringing in outside um, state partners like Unite Here who have members or have a, you know, are interested in coming to North Carolina. Um, and it's not going to happen without a huge increase in investment here, um, here in the state. Groups are already on the doors and at the same time they're raising money to keep being on the doors. Um, so it's just, it's a really exciting moment here in North Carolina. Um, in addition, in Georgia, um, we've got some incredible groups on the ground. Uh, and we found out, you know, here in North Carolina, we, we everybody watches Georgia, but we watch Georgia, I think, maybe more than, <laughs> than some other states, um, because we, we, are, we are excited. We want to be them. We want to be Georgia. Um, and their scaled up field operations were critical to their Senate victories that they've won recently. And when we saw Georgia folks knock five million doors for a runoff, we were like, we need to do that, too. Um, one of the fastest growing communities in Georgia um, is the AAPI community. And um, one of our partners, Asian American Advocacy Fund, is leading a shift towards space building, specifically in Gwinnett and Cobb County, which are in central Georgia, um, to turn out a AAPI voters. And so as we're seeing the South change, these shifting demographics um, in our communities, we've got groups on the ground who are able to reach people in their own languages with culturally competent outreach materials to bring those new communities um, and those growing communities into, into our big tent movements um, and build the, the skills, the narrative skills and the, the field skills that we really need um, to turn out voters. So there are no more trusted voices than our partners on the ground. They are by far in the best position to inspire and encourage people to come out to the polls. And I'm really excited to see the work that they're, that they're already doing in our states and that they're gonna continue to do. I love it. I, I remember you saying like, God, we got to bring Unite here to North Carolina. I've and, been saying it for years. <laughs> and, and, and I'm you, so you, excited. You sort of bribed them to, you know. Well, I kind of um, did, yeah, a little bit. Here's a grant. <laughs> but they but they, they have these workers at the Charlotte Airport, and they're hoping to be able to expand their, their presence in the state. And if they are able to do that, then we've got this, you know, incredible political program that they've built nationally. And all we have to do is just, like, plug and play um, into North Carolina. And I'm super duper excited um, for, for that potentiality. You might hear does incredible work um, in the other states that they're in. And I'm like, recruit, recruit, recruit. <laughs> I love it. Okay. So we're going to bring in Sarah, um, who is responsible for the Northeast. Um, so obviously, which includes Pennsylvania, but you also have the battleground of New York and a possibly scary new Senate race in Maryland. And of course, your home state, New Hampshire, which has the only other competitive governor's race as well. Yeah, as hi well everyone. Yeah, so when I think about Pennsylvania, I think of three words, momentum, momentum, momentum. Pennsylvania went blue in 2020. We've seen electoral wins over the last five years in Pennsylvania, culminating with last year with our Supreme Court work with many partners to win that seat on the Supreme Court race. But I also think too about all the work that needs to happen between now and November in order to continue that momentum. You now we're spending time engaging voters on the presidential, expanding engagement of the electorate in really significant ways in terms of both demographics and geography. And we're also working in election administration places, you know, particularly the vote by mail work. I think, you know, across the country, um, Pennsylvania inclusive in 2020, we saw the boom of vote by mail. It went down understandably a bit in 2022 as the COVID um, decreased, but it's still an important force in Pennsylvania. And so as we think about all the work that's happening in Pennsylvania, we're thinking about expanding the electorate, the geographies, the demographics. We're also thinking about that really critical piece of election administration as well. Um, you know, we do have some other states, as Billy mentioned, that I think are gonna be pretty important as we go forward. Um, you know, New Hampshire should never be considered likely for Democrats. Um, the, it's too volatile in New Hampshire. Our largest voting bloc here identifies as independents. And in a state with so few voters compared to other presidential swing states, the smallest of margins can really move the, the needle from one to the other. But at the same time, New Hampshire also presents one, one of the few competitive governor's races um, and the opportunity 
to break up a Republican trifecta. Um, and you, you can imagine how I am salivating at the opportunity to break up a Republican trifecta and end essentially the reign of terror that we've had in this state. Um, I'll wrap up very briefly with Maryland and New York. You know, Maryland, their former governor, Hogan, he just entered the US Senate race and he historically has had appeal across party lines. I worked in Maryland pretty intensively um, under when Trump was the president and he was looking to uh, attack the Affordable Care Act. And Hogan was a really important persuasion point in that, in that work. And I gotta tell you, this man is scary. I don't want anyone to not think about Maryland next week next month and in November. Um, the last thing I'll wrap up with is New York. Um, so I'm from New Hampshire, but my colleague Javier typically says, where are you from? Now, where are you really, really from? <laughs> I'm from New Hampshire. I'm really, really from the state of New York. <laughs> and New York is home to about a dozen competitive US House districts. You know, we won the special election there, CD3 um, in February, which is in New York City with our partners in Battleground New York. And we have significant work to do to win the other US House races, looking at about a half dozen congressional races there. Um, so I'll wrap up and just say, there's an enormous amount of work to do in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic, but I am optimistic that the partners at MVP are uniquely positioned to get us across the finish line. Yes, and Sarah's actually one of the world's experts in advocacy in these battlegrounds in, uh, so she, she's like geeking out with the Maryland people about what what she learned from from these uh, blue state Republican mm -hmm. governors and uh, yeah okay let's bring in the Midwest and actually I I'm asking Javier to do a little bit deeper dive um, because Javier is actually one of the architects of uh, the Minnesota miracle and also obviously is now responsible for supporting the work in Michigan and Wisconsin, which have been a lot in the news lately. And also the Midwest is really our most developed region as a region. Our, our former Minnesota director, who's now a board member, Laura Flynn, is part of something now called Win the Midwest and Organize the Midwest, which is a close sibling organization that we're working really closely together, um, which is really what we want to see with all the regions. Um, so I want you to do a, a little bit deeper dive um, tell us the, the story from the Midwest. All right, absolutely. Uh, so thanks, Billy, and thanks everyone for being here. This is really great to see so many people on. So um, let me start by taking us back to uh, November 9, 2016. And I hate to do that because obviously that was uh, horrible that morning waking up to the reality. Um, it was such a stark reality that the that the only uh, thing I could think to do was to angrily propose to my uh, uh, partner. And uh, we got married before Trump was inaugurated. We made lemonade out of uh, lemons. And that's what the Trump years felt like, that what, what prog the best what progressives could do was to make lemonade out of lemons. And that sucked frankly um uh we want to be proactive we want to we want to build a progressive future and so let me start by talking about how we uh, uh um in minnesota uh like um and because i think minnesota is important one because i think it's a perfect example of our mvp model but two because it shows us that there's something better than uh than making lemonade out of, out of lemons but we can actually have a proactive uh ha have a proactive agenda so um you might have seen some of the headlines i love to brag about my state but i'm gonna so i'm i'm gonna start with that but with a, with a purpose the last legislative session uh minnesota legislature and the governor signed bills to restore the vote for formerly incarcerated restore driver's licenses for all who work, live and work in the state including on undocumented immigrants, passed a 100% uh, ener renewable energy standard, repealed laws restricting access to abortion, and passed proactive legislation to protect reproductive rights, made Minnesota a sanctuary state for trans individuals and families, leaving states that are criminalizing their existence. We passed paid family medical leave, one pre-registration for uh, 16 and 17-year-olds and other, had other expansions of ballot access, raised child care assistance, um, uh, and created a new department for children, youth, and families. Uh, a billion invested in affordable housing, expanded our public option for health care to cover undocumented children and adults, legalized cannabis and created a process for undoing prior uh, convictions for uh, cannabis use, um, passed a red flag law and expanded background checks, passed, child passed the best child tax credit in the country that will cut childhood party, party by a third, and passed long-term dedicated funding to create fast uh, um, uh, um, uh, transit um, through uh, through the metropolitan area. Now, 
you might hear this long list of things and say, well, yeah, sure, of course, you guys, you know, Minnesota has voted to her Democrats, um, uh, you know, for, for decades for president and you're Minnesotans, you all get along, you're progressive, yada, yada, yada. Well, if you think any of those things, you would be wrong. Uh, in 2016, when the Hillary Clinton campaign um, uh, thought, uh, you know, well, remember the Midwest firewall, that was the thing I woke up to uh, on uh, November 9th, uh, 2016, was the reality that firewall had fallen apart. And Minnesota, um, Hillary won, Hillary Clinton won by 44,000 votes. That was a 1.5% margin. We barely escaped the fate of Wisconsin and Michigan. Um, and, and this legislature, this last legislature that passed all these things, a thousand votes made the difference between majorities in both the House and, uh, and the Senate. We have a five vote majority in the House and a one vote majority in the Senate. Every one of those policy victories depended on a one vote um, majority in the in the Senate. So so then what what gives? So what gives is um, that uh, Minnesota is like the rest of the Midwest, and I think we can we can uh, uh, apply lessons here in, in all the states um, that, that we talk about in the Midwest, is Minnesota is contested territory. How we won these is the real reason why I wanted to start boasting about my state, because how we won here exemplifies MV MVP's model um, uh, and this framework for how we believe we will change the entire Midwest and then the country. Um, what these victories have in common is that it, uh, like almost every one of these policy victories had communities and organizations behind them. They pushed elected officials to go further than they wanted to go um, on issues like expanding um, uh, health care access. It was because there were organized uh, communities um, that that have been, you know, some of them were campaigns that have been like a 20 year long campaign to win driver's licenses, for example, but also because these groups were often working with each other. I like to, to, to tell this lovely story about when, when the driver's license campaign was at the legislature and had a hearing and, um, and the restore the vote campaign was outside the hearing room because they were up next and they were texting the people in the room saying, can you save us seats? Um, like there was that kind of collaboration happening at a, at a very basic level, but also like helping each other out because these victories belong not just to these individual communities and organizations, but to the ecosystem as a whole. At MVP, we invest in groups that have the trust of communities, as, as Hallie uh, spoke to, uh, groups that do the kind of work that campaigns are, are not well suited to do because they have trust in the community because they work year round. We invest in groups that use elections as one tool in their toolbox for making for making change. Um, and, uh, and that investment in the ecosystem, what that means is that our groups think of um, ask bigger questions, ask uh, the, 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 and have bigger asks and therefore bigger victories. In the words of an MVP uh, partner and, um, and leader on the ground in Minnesota, Veronica Mendez, who is the executive director of a worker, uh, uh, a worker center here in Minnesota, um, she said uh, with regards to the Minnesota's ecosystem, we have decided, their organization, we have decided that we no longer take on fights that we can win on our own because they are by definition too small. That is what we are trying to build across the Midwest. Our neighbor to the East in Wisconsin looked lost to progressives after Scott Walker ravaged that state's infrastructure. Our fantastic state advisor there, Rima uh, Ahmad, is a, is a key background part of that story of how groups on the ground have slowly clawed their way back. Last year, partners she worked with flipped the state Supreme Court to a liberal majority. That has resulted in protecting abortion rights as well as um, uh, re, a redrawing of, uh, of uh, re, uh, re, redistricting maps to undo extreme gerrymandering in that, uh, gerrymandering in that state. Our Michigan State Advisor, Jamila Martin, also exemplifies how our state advisors are at the heart of MVP's special sauce. She was a movement leader herself before coming to MVP, and she has the trust of groups who share their capacity needs, and, um, and she's able to co-create with them to build out that state ecosystem. So Michigan groups, they won a trifecta in 2022. They're, they have been frustrated that they've not had as many uh, of, of the victories that are community driven. And so they are working now to build out their internal, their, 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 uh, their power as organizations 
building that collective space of this of the ecosystem um so that it's their their victories are not simply defined by how much democrats are willing to do de elected democrats but how much community is willing to push democrats to do more and this year ohio is showing us that even ohio which has looked like lost to progressives for a long time, that it is too contested territory. Coming off two unexpectedly strong victories last year with ballot questions, one that protected democracy in that state and the other that protected abortion rights. Um, uh, the, there's this year, um, one, uh, Senator Sherrod Brown, um, a, de a popular Democratic se uh, Democratic senator in a, in a state that has gone deep red in recent years, is up for re-election and he does look um, right now, we feel uh, good that he was. He has a very good shot of keeping of keeping that seat. Um, and fair redistricting is on the ballot as a constitution as a constitutional amendment, and that is um, that will make that victory um, will make that state put suddenly put it in play across the Midwest. What we see is that like this is not a question of like is it won to progressives or is it lost to progressives. The Midwest is contested territory. And Ohio this year, we really have the opportunity in Ohio to win all the things. We could win Sherrod Brown's race. We could win redistricting. We could set ourselves up for a battle next year to win a um, a uh, voter bill of rights that will undo years of uh, voter suppression in that state. Um, and we can truly make the Midwest, the progressive firewall that we thought it was in 2016 and woke up to November 9th realizing it was not. We are now, our organizers on the ground, the, our community partners across the Midwest are making that real and sustainable. Ooh, I love this. And I'm also <laughs> in the chat seeing people organizing by regions. I see you guys. Okay, this is so exciting. Ah, um, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna open it up now um, and we're going to kind of go Brady Bunch style. And um, I'm just going to ask you guys a, a an opening question, which is what's really inspiring you? Like cool, interesting things developing on the ground um, and what's keeping you up at night? And we're just going to go popcorn style. Who wants to go first? I can go first. Um, yeah, so I think the thing that's most exciting to me is just the energy that we're seeing from folks who are like already getting yeah. out into the field. Uh, and are and are ready to dramatically increase, you know, their field the operations. Question was, what's inspiring you? Oopsies, <laughs> well, good. Um, and you know, what's keeping me up at night is I think the same thing that's keeping our partners up at night is whether we're going to have the resources that we need to knock four million doors in North Carolina this year. Um, our groups have built this huge, wildly ambitious field plan. Um, as I said before, and Billy highlighted, it's four times the size of anything we've ever done in the state before. Um, and so we have to raise four times the resources that we ever have and than we ever have before and also bring in national partners that can fill in the gaps that our groups um, don't have the capacity to do in state. And so um, we, we know we can make it happen if we get the resources to the ground in time um, in order to get scaled up so that we're ready to knock those doors um, before that election. And, and yeah, I mean, it all, it all comes down to how, how well can we resource these groups to fulfill these big, big dreams? Yes. And I'm just seeing in the chat, um, Jessica <clears throat> Craven asked, what group is Jillian with again? Um, hi, Jessica Craven. We love you guys. Um, so every, yeah, <laughs> uh, we, we got the, the, um, the swag. So everyone you're hearing from on this call are MVPs regional directors and uh, Jillian's a former uh, mayor pro tem of Durham, North Carolina. Um, and she left her her government um, role to, to work with us. So I, I can jump in and say what's been inspiring me. So um, one thing I'm really inspired about this cycle in the great state of Montana, which we haven't spoken about yet on this call, um, Obviously, there's a really high profile Senate race there and our partners are, you know, throwing down with all they've got to make sure Senator John Tester is reelected there this year. But I think what is maybe under the radar in Montana is just how much opportunity there is really up and down the ballot. There are two um, state Supreme Court seats up in Montana this year, and with them is at stake the 
balance of power on that court, which so far has been a really important backstop for conservative progress in the state. It's made, it's protected abortion in Montana, as well as other important progressive policy there. And um, it's really, really critical that we win those races. Also, Montana has an independent redistricting commission, which this cycle will be the first year that they're doing their legislative um, elections with their new maps, which turned out super well. Montana is not a state with problematic gerrymandering. It's a state that has probably the most opportunity for Democratic pickups in the legislature that we've seen in decades. And recruitment for those races has gone really well. I was just actually talking to the Montana table director yesterday, and she told me they've got candidates they feel really solid about in every potentially competitive district there. So um, I'm just excited about how much progress we could make in Montana this year. And then I'll say to flip it, what... Um, what I see that's keeping me up at night a little bit there, and this is really generalizable, I'd say, to the country. It's not only Montana that this is an issue in. You know, 2020 was a weird year for field organizing. It was COVID, like the height of COVID, and it meant that some programs were smaller. Many, you know, programs didn't go door to door in the same way that they had in the past. And then in 2022, not every state had a big cycle. Montana didn't have a big cycle in the same way in 2022. And so the field organizing leadership that they have in some cases is a little green. Maybe they've got one cycle under their belt. Maybe they're really strong raw talent that's got some organizing chops, but doesn't really have a major federal election cycle under their belt. And so making sure those folks now in the early part of the cycle get really solid mentorship, training, coaching, support for them to be able to really step up and do the jobs they need to do in the fall is really critical. I loved hearing from the Montana table that in that case, they've hired you know some really seasoned folks to provide that um, support and coaching. And they're doing that weekly in a cohort with all the partners they're working with in Montana. I think that's a model other states should look to, but um, that's definitely, I think, a need that needs to be addressed in the field. Cool. And, and one of my favorite things about this regional model is the cross state pollination, like something happens in one state and then they're like, Ooh, did you hear about this? Oh, maybe we could help this state do it. It's like, yeah, it's, oh, <laughs> you guys are so great. Uh, who else wants to talk about what you're, what's keeping you up at night and what you're inspired by? Um, I get your bit. And I, I feel like the, to me, what's, I, I, well, so in 2022, MVP was one of the organizations to say that we're going to, we're going to like not assume that red, the red wave is what's going to happen. We're going to, we're going to fight that. And we actually like, we're one of the organizations to say we're going to do that. And to be, it could, could say like, Hey, we, we, we set out to do this. We did this. I feel like this year, progressives just nationally we are everyone is rightly scared we do not want a repeat of november 9th uh, 2016 we don't want to wake up like that ever again and but i and i i fear that we're being we're perhaps being too on defense not thinking of like that we need to be 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 planning for proactive uh uh policy making and and progressive victories into the future but at the same time understanding that and and, and I it's a conflicting feeling I was just telling to Bill, saying this to Billy this morning like I feel like we're being maybe too defensive but but also not defensive enough like the Midwest is contested territory I like uh, the thing I get nervous about when I lay out all those victories in Minnesota is that the people hear that and say like check that off okay fine Minnesota's good Minnesota is contested territory the recent polling in Minnesota has it very very close Hillary Clinton close um, so, uh, so what keeps me up at night is just this uncertainty about what is the, what is the battleground going to be? How, is it going to be a wide map for, for us or, or, or a small map? And I think we have to be prepared for lots of different scenarios. Yeah. I'll wrap up that the thing that's, um, uh, keeping me up at night, but also inspiring me at the same time is the fragility of our democratic processes and our democratic institutions. We've seen how fragile they are. We've seen them under attack by, by the right. But what, what inspires me though, is the work that our partners are doing to ensure our democratic processes are, are accessible, safe, and have integrity. You know, I think about Pennsylvania and the passage of automatic voter registration after years and years and years of work. I think about in New Hampshire, how MVP is funding work for the upcoming town elections in March, where voters will choose who their election administrators are for November. So here, that's the kind of forward thinking and proactive work you can expect out of MVP to be thinking about who are the people in November that are going to be running our elections and how do we make sure in March that those right people are elected. 
Okay, I love it. Oh, so time check. We are um we get we're getting toward the end of time and I have lots of questions. Um I think I'll just read a couple questions and you guys can dive in with whatever's like most interesting, you know, on top of mind for you to talk about. So, um so one set of questions is how are you seeing the dynamics around the the ceasefire and uncommitted movements playing out, especially with with core constituencies, with young voters, with Arab and Muslim voters, the votes of color, progressive voters playing out. Um, and parallel to that, um, how are you seeing organizations work, working on a whole range of issues on abortion rights, on climate, on LGBTQ rights, and electoralizing those issues um, and how they're planning to to do the the two step with that at the polls. Um, also really interested to hear more about your ecosystem organizing and what a good healthy ecosystem looks like um, and just the unique dynamics of this election and how you and the partners are are preparing for it. Um, so I know that's a lot of questions, but uh, basically start, right? lots of prompts to give us your most interesting stuff. I can start with, so uncommitted. So last night in Minnesota, um, uh, um, uncommitted received uh, over 15% of the statewide vote and in two congressional districts winning probably three delegates to the national convention. I know that makes some people nervous. I've seen some of it in the, in the chat. Let me tell you why it does not make me nervous. So this happened organically in Minnesota after, I think, largely as a result of the headlines coming out of, out of Michigan. People frustrated. If we think about the other party, the other party has become beholden to a base that, that, that demands more and more extremism of them. Our base is participating in the democratic process to tell the president that they disagree with the policy direction. I think that is fundamentally a good thing. We are movement voter project, as, as uh, Billy, Billy said earlier, and what we have this year is a persuasion problem that we need to solve, that that's what we're solving for. And every persuasion problem is solved by organizing. We don't, we don't solve it by saying, okay, well, we'll just take them off of our, off the list of people we'll talk to. No, that's the that like whether we want it to be there or not. The reality is is that this mo this organizing is happening, and what it is, it is mobilizing people who are otherwise, frankly, depressed. They are very sad. A lot of like Muslim voters are feeling that that dehumanized, feeling like this this like that the country is not respecting uh, respecting lives. And and what, what however one feels about these issues uh, about and about the war and all this. That that feeling in the in community is just something it, that is the persuasion issue that we have to that we have to address. So to me, I take a lot of inspiration from the fact that people are choosing that as the path to to make their voice heard, um, because that is an opening point. That is an entry point for the conversations that need to happen for persuasion to happen. All right, we have time for what do you think? One more, Billy? Yeah, well, um, no, I'd love to hear from everyone. We're we're gonna do the the closing part quickly. Um, so yeah, what when, when uh, why don't we just do kind of closing thoughts of what's what's most uh, kind of big on people's minds? Well, I guess following up the thread from Javier, I would say, um, in terms of the voters, like the, what's the big problem we have to think about in terms of um, a pivot from voting and committed to the general election? I know, Billy, you were bringing that up when we were preparing for this call. I feel like the biggest worry I would have here is about folks not, especially young voters, but folks in general, not showing up to vote this year, not about uncommitted voters getting on board to vote for Biden. Honestly, if you're voting and committed in a primary, you're probably like one of the most engaged voters in the country. Um, well, you definitely are, right? There's far more people that are feeling disaffected, are feeling disengaged for understandable reasons that you know date back far beyond last year um, and motivating those voters to turn out is the core challenge that we and our groups face this year. The good news is that what the research shows motivates voters is hearing people, hearing from people that they 
feel that human connection Billy was talking to that are connecting with them on issues, helping them to see the stakes of the election and helping them feel that their vote is a part of celebrating their community, being a part of a collective that's building its power. That um, it sounds nice, but there's actually research to back it up. I was talking yesterday, a colleague and I were on the phone with Melissa Michelson, who's a, a political scientist here in the Bay, who's coming out with a book, um, Party at the Mailbox, that I'm excited to read in the fall, that shows just that, that when folks um, feel like their vote is a part of a collective and a part of a community effort that they're proud of and, and, and it feels like a celebration, that's really effective in turning them out. And our groups, the credibility that they have, having been in the community for a long time, um, being representative of and culturally competent in the communities they're talking to is what we need to motivate those voters. And we're, we're ready to scale the work to meet the challenge. Yeah. And I just want to double click on that, having been in conversation with um, a bunch of the people who have been involved in the uncommitted campaigns. It has been, everyone else in the country is depressed. They have been so motivated, excited, celebrating, and exactly what Hallie's talking about. And li literally, we have not heard from one single partner, like we've been in lots of conversation about this. Nobody wants Trump to be president. Nobody wants a third party candidate. The Biden thing is tough. We're pushing, you know, but negative partisanship is the most, it, it, we don't need every group to be like, yay, vote for Biden. We need people to, to say, this is why we have to vote as a community. These are the things we have to stop. These are our values. This is the power of our community. Negative partisanship is actually stronger than positive partisanship right now, especially with, so people don't need to say Biden. You know, that's, anyway, there's a lot of education of donors that needs to happen because donors like, but what if they're not endorsing Biden? It'll all fall apart. That's not how it works. So mo most of our groups didn't endorse Biden in 2020. They don't talk about the presidential candidate. They talk about the work and the communities and then voters go in and we win. Um, so uh, Jillian and Sarah, closing thoughts. Yeah, um, I'll just add, you know, in North Carolina, we have seen, you know, very similar um, campaigns around around uncommitted voters. I saw a statistic today that 40% of the students at, at the UNC Chapel Hill campus, which is the flagship public university in North Carolina, um, voted uncommitted. And so I think the youth vote and the persuasion campaign that we can do with youth is going to be um, is going to be really critical. And MVP's partners have incredible youth mobilization, youth outreach strategies that um, that I think are going to be are going to play a huge role and be really and be really successful. Um, so while there is a lot of anger and disappointment and, and lack of enthusiasm at play, the absolute best people to talk to those voters are the organizations in the communities that they trust, people that they've been working with year after year to do the kind of issue work and um, and social work that that people in their communities need. When those people come to them and say, this is what we all need to do together and this is why, those are the folks they're going to trust. Um, and so I think our, our absolute best possible chance at turning this around is supporting supporting those folks on the ground. Um, and also to really, you know, understand like our young people are sending a really powerful message. Like they are telling us that the actions of our government are out of alignment with their ethical values and their political commitments. Um, and it's important that we listen to them and that we hear them at the same time that we are motivating and engaging them to continue to build, um, to continue to, you know, to take the actions that we need to take to build the best possible world for all of us, which is to go to the polls and vote for the Democrats. Yeah, and Sarah, um, I'll let you have the last word and then we'll have a special closing. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I, I'm really excited about what I'm already seeing is the impact of early dollars in the field. I'm looking at Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is a state that historically most of the work has happened in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and some of those surrounding urban spaces. Because of changing demographics and the way that Pennsylvania is evolving, so many of our groups now are moving into other spaces. And what I'm seeing is early funding, allowing our partners to be in rural communities, engaging BIPOC voters, 
young voters. Those are some of the most persuadable voters within rural communities in Pennsylvania and across the country. And I'm seeing the impact of the early dollars already. This work now is going to make our work down the road much easier and much more effective. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's bring in Julie Johansson. Thank you. Just give a lot of love to our incredible team and welcome, Julia. So we we're like, hmm, um, let, let's have a donor talk about, about how you're seeing this election. Um, and someone's like, Julia Johansson, we're all like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and Julia, um, let's go back to slides for a second. Um, I just want to say really quickly, yes. Um, so Julia runs Impact Collective which you'll see the mission is a closing the racial wealth gap, basically. Um, and in addition to that, she supports MVP. Um, so we just want to hear your like fresh uh, reflections on this and uh, want to encourage everyone else to reflect as Julie is talking as well. Thank you, Billy. This is once again, deeply inspiring. I, every time I have the opportunity to be with MVP, I feel inspired um, and really moved. I, Hallie, Javier, Jillian, Sarah, thank you. I, we, this work is so incredibly important. And I was thinking about speaking this morning and thinking about while you all were speaking about how inspired I feel. And yet I know that tomorrow morning I'm going to wake up and I'm going to scroll through the New York Times or I'm going to turn on NPR and I'm going to feel overwhelmed. And I'm going to maybe feel paralyzed. And I assume that um, others on the call feel that way as well. This is a really, really overwhelming political environment and cultural environment to live through. And for me, my connection to MVP has been the antidote to that despair. And it has also answered a strategic question that I've had, which when I was first introduced to MVP in 2020, just before we all went into COVID isolation, um, I understood for the first time the importance of grassroots organizing. I'm a very well-educated American person, and I had not understood the importance of grassroots organizing. And I had not ever understood that I could somehow be connected to grassroots organizing. And the way that I can connect is through MVP. So for me, it was like a huge light bulb moment and opportunity. And I think about all the incredibly inspiring things um, that Jillian was sharing in particular, like when you think about how can I here in my home in Brookline help get 42 more votes in North Carolina? How can I help get 4 million more doors knocked on? How can I not have to go to bed thinking about this every single night and wake up thinking about it every single night, which Billy does? How can I sleep well at night? How can I combat the paralysis and overwhelm and despair? I do that by giving to MVP and giving really generously and giving early in the cycle and giving every year. That's how we can do it. And I can also mobilize the people in my community. So it's not appropriate for me to go to North Carolina and knock on doors. Um, we might have lovely conversations, but I'm not the best person to do that. I am the person to organize the people in Brookline, in Boston, in the various networks, alumni networks, professional networks, neighborhood networks that I'm tapped into, that's the work that I can do and that I really, really want to do. And I loved just closing with Hallie's idea of how your, your vote, when it's part of a collective that is connected and moving forward together is something you can feel really good about. And I was sort of giggling. That is exactly how it feels for me when I donate to MVP. I feel like my donation to MVP is part of a collective that I can feel really good about because we're all doing something incredibly strategic and impactful. So thank you for being here. Billy, thank you for your incredible inspiration and give, 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 and spread the word about MVP. People are here to help you plan parties virtually, in person, coffees, cocktails, doesn't matter. We want you to bring all your people to us and spread the word and have them open their credit cards like Larry was doing and their checkbooks and their wallets. Thank you so much. Yes, Julia, thank you. You know, we're on, um, in the 2020 cycle, we had close to 500 events in that cycle and we're getting close to our first hundred now. So just as Julia said, there there's a place on the website where you can sign up and say, I wanna have a Zoom party and introduce MVP to people. 
we have volunteers who um, have created a deck who can train you how to present it. And we're going to do this together, just like the organizers are doing it. Just like Julia said, it's our job to organize everyone we know. We hold hands, we jump, we win, we have a better future, yada, yada. And um, we, we can then celebrate. So um, as is up on your screen, movement.vote slash party. You can do more than donate. And if you are haven't already figured out how to make the biggest investment ever, go to that slide. Um, you talk to your MVP liaison. If you don't know who your advisor is or can't remember which one is the person, um, you can just email advisor at movement.vote and we'll either get you an advisor or plug you back in with your advisor here. We Our job is to be honest brokers to help you move your money to the best place um, you can move it to, um, either as part of a pool or if you really want to invest in Georgia or wh wherever you want to invest, we are here to help you do that. So go team. We are going to win this together and um, happy eight months to go. And let's make this happen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone on the MVP team, all the volunteers, all the staff, all the donors, all our partners. We're building the beloved community together. And, um, you know, what, what more can I say? Thank you all and go team.